welcome back for another Share Facilitium video. Today, we're going to discuss whether higher USMLE scores really predict patient care outcomes. And this is going to be a journal club, which, as loyal viewers know, is an irregular feature on this channel where I review a recent journal article and use it as a jumping off point for a lively discussion. So don't worry, this is not your program director's journal club. Here's the article I'm going to discuss. The Association Between USMLE Performance and Outcomes of Patient Care by Norsini et al., which was published in March 2024 in Academic Medicine, but actually it came out online some months before that, and um, when it did, I read it, and then I tried my best to ignore it in the hopes that others would too. But after the print edition came out, sometime by late March, I had seen enough congratulatory and non-critical social media discussion about this article that I decided that this was probably something the Sheriff of Sodium needed to talk about. So I added it to the list and, well, today's the day. I wanna start by briefly summarizing the article so that we're all on the same page and everyone begins with a reasonable foundation about what the paper says. The objective here is to determine whether there's an association between physician performance on the USMLE and outcomes of patient care. And in theory, that's a pretty simple thing to do. Uh, I mean, all we really need are four things. We need a big data set of doctors and patients, and then we need the USMLE performance of the doctors, and we need the clinical outcomes of the patients. And then once we have those things, all we'll need is just a little bit of math to decide whether those things are actually associated with each other. To get a big data set of doctors and patients, the authors use the Pennsylvania Healthcare Cost Containment Council's data set which is called PHC-4. Every time that a patient gets discharged from a hospital in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the hospital has to send certain data about that patient and their hospitalization to the PHC-4. And those data include what the patient was in the hospital for, how long they stayed, whether they survived or passed away, and who the attending physician of record was. Of course, there's a lot of different types of hospitals in Pennsylvania, and they care for lots of different people who end up in the hospital for lots of different reasons. So to make things a little simpler and, and facilitate cleaner comparisons, the authors decided to, to focus only on patients that were admitted for one of five common medical conditions. Those were acute myocardial infarction, heart failure, stroke, pneumonia, and COPD. And they did this for patients who were hospitalized over a three-year period from January of 2017 to December of 2019, so they'll avoid any effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. There's also a lot of different types of doctors in Pennsylvania. And so, again, to facilitate a more natural comparison, the authors decided to focus only on generalists and exclude specialists and subspecialists. So what they did is they used the AMA Physician Master File to limit their analysis only to physicians who self-identified as being a family medicine physician or a general internal medicine physician. If you described yourself as being anything other than that, you're out. And then, among this group, they excluded physicians who held a board certification in anything other than internal medicine or family medicine. Sound good so far? So now we got a big data set of doctors and patients, and now we just need the USMLE scores and the clinical outcomes and the math, and then we'll be cooking. So to measure USMLE performance, the authors created a composite measure that averaged the performance on the doctor's first attempt at the USMLE Step 1, Step 2 CK, and Step 3 examinations. So instead of having to do math with three different numbers, now we just have one. And that number, it's actually a Z-score that expresses how far from the overall mean of performance that doctor's Step 1, Step 2, and Step 3 scores were. So now we need the clinical outcomes and the authors chose two from the PHC-4 data set. They decided to use in-hospital mortality, and then for patients who survived to discharge, length of stay. And these are pretty good outcomes because mortality certainly matters to patients, and length of stay is probably pretty important too, and both of these outcomes are objectively defined and resistant to bias. And now that we have all these things, all that's left for us to do is some math to see if there's an association between USMLE performance and the clinical outcomes. 
thing is, you know, USMLE scores can't be the only thing that impacts whether a patient lives or dies or how long they're going to be in the hospital. So the authors decided to include a number of other variables in the model that might impact mortality and length of stay so that they could better isolate the effect of the U physician's USMLE scores. So, for instance, they used a comorbidity index to account for the fact that some patients are sicker than others and more likely to have a bad outcome, even if their doctor did really good on the USMLE. And they adjusted for the primary condition because, all other things being equal, someone being admitted for an acute MI has a higher risk of death than someone being admitted for a COPD exacerbation. And they adjusted for rural versus non-rural hospitals, and they even considered that higher volume physicians or higher volume hospitals might have better outcomes than those with lower volumes. So they included all that in the multivariable model too. And once they'd done all that, here's what they found. When you look at mortality, the higher the doctor's USMLE performance was, the more likely their patients were to make it out of the hospital alive. The adjusted odds ratio for mortality was 0.95. So for every one unit increase in USMLE performance, there was a 5% decrease in the odds of in-hospital mortality. And that's even after adjusting for all those other variables that I showed you just a moment ago. Now let's look at length of stay. And again, when you look at how long a patient will be hospitalized for one of these five common medical conditions, again, we see that the higher the doctor's USMLE scores, the shorter their patients were staying in the hospital. Now here, the adjusted odds ratio was 0.99. So the effect size wasn't quite as large as for mortality, but look at that p-value. It's just 0.001. So you know, this is really good. And if you like those results, and you don't see any flaws in this study design, well, this is probably a good place for you to stop watching this video. Just go ahead and hit the retweet button or uh, make an uncritical comment about what a cool result this is. Or, or actually, you can just sit back in the privacy of your own home and, and let that tiny little sweet burst of dopamine hit your mesolimbic system because you remember how good your USMLE scores were and you know deep down inside you've always thought that you weren't like other doctors and and now by God there's the proof and if you want to do any of that then then please don't let me spoil it for you we can uh, we can just part ways and um, you can go watch something else that confirms your priors but if you keep watching well here's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna work back across some of the ground that we've already covered together, but we're gonna take a closer and a more critical look at some of the things about this paper. And by the end, I'm gonna do my level best to make sure that you have a different opinion about this paper. I'm gonna start with a few softballs. Let's go back to the very beginning. Here, here again is the paper, only now highlighted in red are the authors, and all of them work for the National Board of Medical Examiners. The funding for this study came from examinees' registration fees for the USMLE. Is that a problem? Not necessarily. Does that, by itself, mean that the results shown are untrue? Certainly not. But it does mean that there's a financial conflict of interest, and we should look at this paper with the same degree of skepticism that we would if it were a, a clinical trial of a new medication that was sponsored by the pharmaceutical company. The people who designed the study and collected the data and did the statistical analysis, they benefit financially if the study turns out a certain way, and they don't benefit if it turns out another. Now, pointing out that a financial conflict of interest exists, it is not an allegation of research misconduct. Conflict of interest is a condition, not a behavior. It just means that we need to look closely at whether all the decisions that got made are the decisions that a reasonable person who didn't have a stake in the outcome would have made. So let's start to look at some of those decisions together. I said at the beginning that this was a pretty simple study. We only needed four things, right? But this is probably a pretty good place to point out that one of those things is something that only a small and very select group of people have access to, and that's the USMLE scores. The work that was done here simply cannot be replicated by any other group of researchers outside of the National Board of Medical Examiners because no one else has access to every physician's USMLE scores. Sure, you could try to do a study where you ask doctors what their USMLE scores were and, um, and, and you can see how far you get. And if you need a tutorial and recall bias, non-response bias, or selection bias, I would, I would highly encourage you to go ahead and, and try to replicate that study in such a manner and go ahead and send it out to some reviewers and see what they have to say. The only people in the whole wide world who could do this study 
are the very ones who did it. And out of all the possible studies that they could have published, this is the one they published. I also want to point out that at no point in the manuscript did the authors state that they had filed a statistical analysis plan somewhere before they began collecting or analyzing data. And that's become the standard for certain types of high stakes research like clinical trials, because even in a very simple study, the investigators have to make lots of decisions. You know, how are you going to measure the variables? How are you going to analyze the outcomes? How are you going to adjust for confounders? And the answers to all those questions, they determine the result that you're going to get. Let me give you one interesting example of how this process can play out. Ten years ago, a group of researchers decided to investigate racism among soccer referees. They wondered if darker skinned players might be more likely to get red cards and get ejected from the game by the referee than, than lighter skinned players. So what they did is they assembled a data set of professional soccer players and referees in Europe and they, they included all the red cards that every player had received. And they included lots of other data that might potentially be res relevant like uh, the league they were playing in or the player's position or even the country of origin for the referee. But then they found 29 other research groups and they gave them this data set that they'd built. And they asked each of those groups to build a model and decide if referees were more likely to give red cards to darker skinned players. Here's what happened. Out of the 29 research groups, no group built the same regression model. Actually, there was significant diversity even in the basic analytic approach. Some teams used logistic regression. Others used multiple linear regression or Spearman correlation or Poisson regression or hierarchical log linear modeling or weighted least squares regression with referee fixed effects and clustered standard errors, whatever that is. And within each model, there was significant diversity in which potential confounders to include. There were 19 different permutations of factors that different groups thought should be accounted for. And, and even then, there were differences in how exactly the model would measure and account for those factors. So unsurprisingly, the estimates of the effect of the player's skin color on the likelihood that he'll receive a red card, they were kind of all over the place. 40% of groups found a statistically significant re result but 60% got a non-significant result. Most groups got an odds ratio of around 1.2 to 1.4, meaning that darker skinned players would be 20 to 40% more likely to get red carded, but a couple of groups got an odds ratio point estimate that would suggest that these players were actually less likely to get penalized after you accounted for everything else. And a couple of groups actually came up with odds ratios in the 2.8 to 2.9 range. And again, these are all professional statisticians and researchers using the same data set. It just goes to show how many degrees of freedom researchers have when they're answering even a simple question. And, and most of the ways that they could do it are logical and defensible. So now I want you to imagine that um, we did this study, but now we're going to add a 30th research team. And this research team is going to be composed of professional soccer referees. Where do you think their model is going to fall on this forest plot? Because if you just make decisions as you go along, and option A and option B both seem somewhat reasonable ways of doing things, you're going to be tempted, even unconsciously, to choose the one that makes your effect size the largest and your p-value the smallest in the direction that you think things ought to go. So let's take a look at some of the analytic decisions that the authors made, and, and let's see what you think. Let's start small, and we'll build to ones that I think are increasingly problematic. So first, let's go back and look at those factors that were included in the multivariable adjustment. Here's that list again. Would the results hold up without each one of these? And actually, I gotta say, the manuscript is silent on how the authors chose to use this set of variables for, for multivariable adjustment. Unlike many papers, they didn't use any kind of mathematical justification or select candidate variables using forward or backward selection or, or look at their unadjusted association with the outcomes in the data set, or at least they didn't tell us about that. Maybe they came up with this list after a, a careful literature review of the determinants of in-hospital mortality. Maybe they sketched it out on a cocktail napkin the first time that they ever conceived of doing this study. Or, or maybe they looked at the data and they tinkered and they added variables until the results looked like they'd found and isolated the effect that they thought from the very beginning would be there. And just like we saw in the soccer example, 
Investigators have significant degrees of freedom in how they measure these variables. So here, for instance, they used age as a continuous variable. Now, do you think that that approximates the biological relationship between age and in-hospital mortality for these conditions? If not, then you probably shouldn't model it that way. What about physician and hospital volume? Do we think that there's a linear relationship between those variables and patient outcomes? Because that's how they were analyzed. Or if you think that that relationship is skewed, then, then maybe, I don't know, maybe you should have log transformed those numbers. And actually, I didn't mention this before, but that's exactly what the authors did with the length of stay outcome. They cut off hospitalizations that lasted longer than 40 days, and they log transformed the rest to compress the effect size of large numbers. Or how about patient race and ethnicity? Do we all agree that that has to be in the model? And even if you say, oh, oh yeah, you know, race and ethnicity, they predict in hospital mortality in a way that simply can't be accounted for for any other variable. Well, we still have a few different ways that we could choose to analyze that. And here, the authors chose to lump race and ethnicity together into a single binary categorical variable. So you were either white and non-Hispanic or you were not. Is that the way you'd do it? Next, let's look again at those patient conditions. They looked at five, and they're all common conditions, so from that standpoint, it makes sense. But how they got these five, I don't know. And the decision to use these five, it still kind of caught my eye because this wasn't the first study I've seen from the NBME that associates USMLE scores with outcomes of care. Actually, back in 2014, some of the same authors published this study, which considered only step 2 CK scores and only international medical graduates. And for this study, they looked at only two conditions, acute MI and heart failure, and they found a relationship between higher step 2 CK scores and lower mortality. So which way should we do it? Should we look at individual steps or just roll them all up in one big composite score? Should we look just at MI and heart failure or should we add in COPD or pneumonia or stroke or, or other conditions that we didn't even include in any of these? Should we look at U.S. graduates or IMGs or both? I, I mean, I'm not saying that one is better than another. I'm just saying that the way that they chose to answer this question now is different than what they've done in the past. Here's another decision. And this one you may agree with, but it still introduces selection bias. The authors here excluded patients who were transferred from one hospital to another. And on the one hand, that makes perfectly good sense. But on the other, it means you get a somewhat unusual distribution of patients that get included in this study. Because remember, this is all hospitals in Pennsylvania, and some of those hospitals take care of sicker patients than others. So if you're a doctor at a smaller or less well-resourced hospital, all you gotta do to protect yourself from having patient mortality attributed to you is get your patient to a bigger hospital. And I don't know how high your USMLE scores have to be to do that. On the other hand, if you're at a tertiary care center, the buck stops there. Whatever happens to that patient, is on you, or at least it is in this study. At the same time, if you're a doctor at the smaller hospital, some of the mortality that gets recorded there, it might not necessarily be a bad outcome. I mean, what I mean is, say you live in rural Pennsylvania and you get admitted with end-stage heart failure or COPD, you or your family may recognize that this is unfortunately the end of the road, and they may say, you know, don't transfer them to Pittsburgh or, or Philadelphia. Just keep them comfortable here. My point is that there's a selection bias that you've imposed that changes the distribution of patients with these diagnoses at various hospitals, and that may be a hard thing to adjust for in your multivariable model. And all that might be fine, really, but here's one decision that I think actually is very problematic. So, as I read through this study, I saw this one little thing that caught my eye. Here's what it said. The mean physician volume through the period of study was 11.2 hospitalizations. <clears throat> Hold up. What was that number again? 11.2. 11.2 11 hospitalizations over a three-year period for five of the most common conditions for which human beings get admitted to the hospital. Does that seem right to you? I mean, it makes you wonder what kind of doctors are included in this study. I mean, can you, can you imagine their conversations during sign out? What you got for me, Ted? Oh, you'll never believe the week I've had. I got some real zebras for you. Last night I admitted a patient for, you're not gonna believe this, 
community-acquired pneumonia. Oh, wow, I saw that a couple years ago. I mean, we're talking about patients with some of the most common conditions in all of medicine, and yet somehow the average doctor in this study was taking care of only 11.2 such patients over a three-year period. That's less than one patient with each condition in a given year. I mean, you'd think that a typical hospitalist, they, they might have more than 11.2 patients with these conditions under their care on a given day. But you see, that's the thing. The authors of this study specifically excluded any internist or family physician who described him or herself as being a hospitalist. Now, is that what you would have done? If so, then please comment below and tell me why. Why, if you're doing a study where the primary outcomes are things that happen in the hospital, why you would want to exclude general internists and family physicians who make it their life's work to care for patients in that very location. I think this is really a very curious analytic decision. Actually, there's a good argument to be made that using hospitalists might have been a preferable design. Last year, I got to help write an editorial for this article that appeared in the Annals of Internal Medicine. I'll link to the article and our editorial in the notes below if you're interested. But the study was to evaluate whether there were differences in patient care outcomes between DO or MD physicians. And it was a negative study. They found absolutely no difference. And when I say no difference, it wasn't just that the p-value didn't quite get to 0.05. It was that the point estimate for the difference in every single outcome that was considered, mortality, length of stay, uh, hospital costs, all of that was centered on zero. And among other things, the authors pointed out that they felt that hospitalists were the perfect group in which to test this MD versus DO question because people don't get to choose their hospitalist. I mean, you might choose an MD or a DO for your primary care physician for whatever reasons you choose them for, but when you get sick unpredictably, whoever's on call takes care of you, and that minimizes confounding. So from that standpoint, hospitalists might make the ideal group to evaluate in a study like this. But instead, they were excluded. My point is this. I think it's fair to assume when you see a paper like this that the results that are reported represent a kind of a reasonable best case scenario for the given data. If the authors had gotten a null result or had modeled things in such a way that there appeared to be an inverse effect between USMLE scores and clinical outcomes, do you think they would have spent company time trying to get it published in academic medicine so we could all read about it? Or do you think they might just say, oh, that can't be true, and go back to the drawing board? So the next thing that I want you to think about is this. Under this kind of a reasonable best case scenario in which the only research group in the world with access to USMLE scores gets to choose how to analyze them and see if there's an effect on clinical outcomes, how big and how sturdy is the effect that they found? So let's look again together at the key finding in this study, the association between better USMLE performance and lower in-hospital mortality. We saw that odds ratio was 0.95, and the 95% confidence interval, it got up as high as 0.99, but that's still less than 1. And the p-value is 0.016, which is less than 0.05, which, of course, is the standard that was handed down to us by Moses some 3,500 years ago for statistical significance. So this is a statistically significant result. But in light of all of our discussion before, you might wonder, if we changed much of anything in the multivariable adjustment or with some of these analytic decisions, would this significance hold up? It's an impossible question to answer. Uh, we just don't know. But even if the statistical significance didn't change, even if this p-value of 0 0.02 is just a permanent property of any reasonable model that could be created, the p-value itself tells us nothing about the effect size. The odds ratio here is 0 0.95, so how big of an effect on mortality are we talking about? And as most of you know, there's two things we've got to know to interpret an odds ratio. The first is the units of measure. The odds ratio of 0.95 tells us that for every one unit increase in the predictor variable, the odds of in-hospital mortality decrease by 5%. So what's the unit we're talking about? If you weren't paying attention, you might think that a one unit change in the odds ratio means a one unit change in USMLE score. And if so, that'd be a pretty big effect. 
you go from a USMLE score of 248 to 249, your patient's mortality drops to 95% of what it was before. You go from 249 to 250, it goes to 95% of that. But if you were actually paying attention a few minutes ago, you know that's incorrect. Because what we did is we took all three USMLE scores and we rolled them into one big score and then we standardized it. So what we're really talking about is a single Z score for all three of your USMLE exams. So each one unit represents one standard deviation on the bell curve of USMLE scores. So to achieve this 5% reduction in mortality, it means that your USMLE score has to go up by a full standard deviation. So we're not talking about a 300-point scale. Uh, we're talking about a six-point scale because almost all USMLE scores are going to fall within three standard deviations of the mean, and actually the vast majority are going to fall across a four-point range. Now, the second thing that you need to know to assess uh, an odds ratio is you, ha you have to have some idea about what the baseline odds are. I mean... I could double your odds of winning the Powerball lottery by giving you two tickets instead of one, but that don't mean it's going to happen. So what we need to know is what are the baseline odds for mortality? And in this data set, for all five of the conditions combined, they had 196,881 patients and 4,142 of them died. So that's 2.1%. So the probability or risk of mortality was 2.1%, which I know is not exactly the same thing as odds, but when we're talking about events that are infrequent, the risk of something and the odds of something are, are mathematically similar, and it's easier for us to think about risk. And it's my YouTube channel, so that's what we're going to do, because giving using this number gives us a, a ballpark that we can use to think about how big of an effect we're talking about in real-world terms. And this bell curve here shows you how big that effect is. If we take a completely average doctor with a completely average USMLE score, and we now replace them with a better doctor who did one standard deviation better on the USMLE, that baseline mortality risk of 2.1%, it drops by 5%, and now it's 2.0%. And if we replace that doctor with a gunner doctor who never went to class and matured all their Anki decks and achieved a USMLE composite score that was a full two standard deviations above the mean at the 95th percentile, well now that patient's patient mortality rate goes down again by 5% to around 1.9%. And if you found a doctor whose composite USMLE score was at the 99th percentile, and this doctor, they weren't the king of the world. They were out there practicing general internal medicine or family medicine at a hospital in Pennsylvania. Then this super doctor's patients would get an additional 5% reduction in mortality all the way down to 1.8%. My point is, if you consider the patients of the very worst dullards that society could tolerate passing the USMLE, to the patients of the doctors with the very highest USMLE scores. The range of in-hospital mortality spans only around 0.7%. That's not nothing, but it's not a huge number. And actually, the real-world effect is even smaller because notice how two-thirds of the doctors have USMLE scores that fall within one standard deviation above and below the mean, and the difference in mortality for these kinds of doctors is minimal. I'm just not that impressed with the effect size. But maybe that's just me, because here's what the authors have to say. If replicated, our findings may be of clinical significance when compared to the magnitude of the effects of recommended medical treatments such as low-dose aspirin in the secondary prevention of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events, 18%. Now they get this 18%, by assuming a four standard deviation difference between doctors' USMLE scores. So I'll leave it to you to decide if you think USMLE scores are as useful to patients as low-dose aspirin or not. Instead, I want to move on and look at length of stay. How robust were those results? Here again is the key finding in the paper. The adjusted odds ratio for log length of stay for USMLE performance was 0.99 with a p-value of 0.001. So for every one standard deviation increase in USMLE performance, the log length of stay decreased by 1%. And here again, to put this 1% reduction in perspective, we got to know how long the average hospitalization was. And in this population, the typical hospitalization lasted around four or five days. So if you work out the math, this 1% decrease 
in log transformed length of stay amounts to a little less than a two hour difference. Oh, doctor, all these regular doctors don't get their discharge orders in till noon, but you're discharging your patient and it's only 10 a.m. Why, thank you. You should see my USMLE scores. Now, in fairness, I got to point out that the authors of this paper, they did point out in the discussion that the effect on length of stay was unlikely clinically significant. But of course, that's not going to stop a lot of other authors in the future from citing this paper and saying, quote, Higher USMLE scores are known to be associated with improved mortality and shorter length of stay, end quote. And there'll be a little superscript number that links to this journal article that almost no one is ever going to go back and read. Before I move on, let me briefly review what I've covered so far. I pointed out that there's a financial conflict of interest that makes it more likely that we'll get an analytical model that represents a best case scenario. And some of the decisions about what goes into that model are maybe not the decisions that other groups would have chosen. That is, if there were a group who had access to USMLE data and could even replicate this study. But even in this kind of best case scenario, the effect size that we see isn't that big for mortality and for length of stay, It's so small that it's of no meaningful importance, and it's not at all clear how resistant either finding would be to changing the multivariable model. But maybe after all that, maybe you're still unconvinced. Maybe you accept the way that the authors chose to model everything, and and you say, "I I would have done it exactly the same way. Well, there's still one other problem with this study that you ought to think about. If we go back to the beginning, The fundamental question in this study is whether USMLE scores are associated with patient care outcomes. And I said that this is a simple question, and in many ways it is. But to answer this question, there's one thing that you have to be able to do. And you have to be able to do it very reliably, because if you can't do this one thing, nothing else you do really matters. And that thing is, you have to be able to link a particular patient outcome to a particular physician. If you know a bunch of physicians' USMLE scores and a bunch of patient outcomes, you still have to be confident that the physician whose USMLE scores you're assessing is the one who's responsible for the patient whose outcomes you're assessing. And maybe in the old days that was an easy thing to do because doctors were on call 24-7, and so if one of their patients was in the hospital, well, you could just assume that that doctor and only that doctor was directing their care. But this isn't the old days. Hospital care is complicated. It's not unusual for one doctor to admit a patient and a different doctor to discharge them and different doctors still to round on that patient on the days in between. So if something good or bad happens to that patient, which doctor is responsible? Whose USMLE scores are we going to use to explain away that outcome? The PHC-4 data set lists exactly one attending physician per patient. That doctor is identified by the hospital and is supposed to be the individual that has the responsibility for the patient's care. And it's certainly possible that many, or even most, of the patients in this data set, they might have just seen just one doctor. Maybe the patients in this study had just one doctor, a doctor who had grown so accustomed to just steady grinding from their USMLE dedicated days that this doctor never asked their partner to cover call overnight or actually never switched off at any point during their patient's up to 40 days of hospitalization. Maybe these patients, one doctor never called a cardiology consult for the patient with an acute MI or a neuro consult for the patient with a stroke because, I mean, why would they do that when they already had to learn all those things years ago for the USMLE? Maybe these patients, since they already had their one doctor, they didn't get admitted through the ED. And that's a good thing because if they had, then we might have had to consider what happened down there and how that might have impacted their clinical outcomes. Maybe the patients of this one doctor, they never got transferred to the ICU where a different doctor with different USMLE scores might have played a very important role in their outcome. Maybe all these patients just lived or died with the one doctor on the floor. Or maybe, maybe none of those things are true. Maybe modern healthcare is complicated and analyzing it gets messy and ascribing an outcome like mortality or length of stay to a single doctor is impossible to do in an administrative data set. And if you agree with that, then we got a problem. You can have all the precision in the world in defining USMLE scores or patient outcomes, but if you can't precisely link up those things, the whole thing falls apart. 
I think the very foundation of this study is suspect. But maybe some of you out there still disagree. Maybe, in spite of my overwhelming logic, you still believe that this procedure is good enough and that if the PHC-4 data set has you listed as the doctor, then it is you and your USMLE scores who determine the patient's outcome. And maybe you saw that graphic on absolute risk difference for mortality a few years ago and you said, hell yeah, this is my life we're talking about. Give me the doctor with the 99th percentile USMLE scores. I want that 0.4% absolute risk benefit versus an average doctor. So if this is you and you believe the results of this study are true and trustworthy and you want the doctor with the high USMLE scores because it's your life on the line, then you better listen up because I'm going to give you a few other things that you need to be sure to do. If you really want to reduce your in-hospital mortality, then forget about USMLE scores and make sure you get a female doctor. Look right there at the adjusted odds ratio for mortality for having a female physician, 0.82 with a confidence interval from 0.73 to 0.9 and a p-value of less than 0.001. And, and listen, it is possible that this is a true and real effect. It, this would not be the first paper to show that women physicians have better patient outcomes. There have been several observational studies over the past years that have suggested as much. But this is the single biggest effect size for any non-patient related factor in the whole model. So you might be tempted to say, you know, that's kind of a big effect. I mean, I, I wouldn't have expected such a big difference in outcomes just based on whether your doctor is a man or a woman. But if you think that this modeling is good and the effect of USMLE scores is real, then you've got to accept this too. So you best not let me catch you having any male doctor take care of your granddad in Pennsylvania after he has a heart attack. Or if he has a male doctor, at the very least, don't let that person be listed as the responsible physician in the PHC-4 database. Let's also take a quick look back at the analyses for length of stay because I got some more advice for you if you think these results are good. We talked before about how a one standard deviation difference on the USMLE only gets you out of the hospital two hours sooner. So if you really wanna get out of the hospital fast, you know what you really need? A family physician. Because if you get an internist taking care of you, I hate to tell you, but you're gonna languish in that hospital for 5% longer than if you had a family physician caring for you. And I know that may seem a little strange. I mean, even though the internists in this study, they may only take care of a hospitalized patient with CHF once every year or two, they still got a couple of extra months of inpatient experience during their residency than the family physicians did. And I guess based on this study, we have to conclude that that extra training time actually provides negative utility for getting their patients out of the hospital. And actually, this study gives us one more thing that you got to be real careful about if you want you or your loved ones to be promptly discharged from a Pennsylvania hospital to which they're admitted for one of five common medical conditions. You better make sure that your doctor is not board certified because, sadly, if they are board certified, you can also expect a 5% increase in your log-transformed length of stay. Maybe instead of preparing for those fancy schmancy board exams, these doctors should have been studying first aid so they could learn how to get their patients out of the hospital on time. Or maybe, just maybe, all these unusual findings are actually evidence of residual confounding. They're signs that, despite the fact that your model adjusted for a comorbidity index, there's systematic differences in the kind of patient who receives care from a family physician or an internist, and those differences may explain differences in patient outcomes. Same thing goes for men and women physicians, or board-certified and not board-certified physicians. These groups of doctors probably work in slightly different locations, and they care for slightly different patients and admit them to slightly different types of hospitals with slightly different capabilities. And it's very hard to say that those very difficult to account for differences are not the differences that are responsible for the differences that we see now in patient outcomes. I wanna give you one last thing to think about before I close. I didn't play it up at the beginning, but it may have occurred to some of you that the very premise of this study is a little bit strained. Doctors start taking the USMLE when they're still wet behind the ears preclinical medical students, and most of them finish taking it before they've even finished their internship. But we think that their performance on this exam is going to be a credible predictor of what happens to their patients 10, 15, 25 years later when they're in the hospital.
I mean, a lot of things happen between the exposure and the outcome of interest in this study. And some of the things that happen are actually strongly influenced by the USMLE scores themselves. We use USMLE scores in residency selection. Doctors who get trained at the most sought after internal medicine or family medicine residencies, they have higher USMLE scores than those who didn't get that opportunity. So is it the doctor's USMLE score or the quality of their residency training that most influence their patient outcomes? Or even if, even if all residency training is equally good, doctors who train at the most sought after residencies, they get the inside track for the most sought after jobs. Do you think it's more likely that you'll find a high scoring doctor with a nice training pedigree practicing general internal medicine at some safety net urban clinic or a rural health system with a shoestring budget? Or do you think you're more likely to find them in the affluent suburbs of Pittsburgh or Philadelphia, working for a big group and having admitting privileges at a well-staffed and resourced hospital? Do you think that patients who have more favorable social determinants of health, who are independently more likely to have favorable outcomes than other patients, do you think that those patients are, are more or less likely to seek out such doctors to take care of them when they get sick? Yeah, you're right. Or actually, I, I guess I don't know if you're right or not, because this is a recording and I can't hear you, but I know that this channel attracts a sophisticated and erudite audience who will clearly recognize that there's an accumulation of advantage that gets set in motion by differences in USMLE scores, where those with higher scores get selected to receive better training that leads to more preferred job opportunities, which are more likely to be in clinical settings or with patient populations who are more likely to have favorable outcomes. It's the Matthew effect. For to everyone who has, more shall be given and he will have an abundance. Because see, an audience like the audience I have for this channel, they'll think harder about the premise of this study, and they'll recognize that the patients included all had very common medical conditions. Heart failure, COPD, pneumonia, stroke, MI. These are not medical mysteries. Th these are not house MD cases. I think that we as a society should not only hope, but expect that any licensed physician caring for such patients should know the basic script and decision-making involved. Because an audience like you all, who have spent time in a hospital lately and have some awareness about how medical decision-making translates into patient outcomes, you'll probably recognize that patients who get discharged earlier in a study like this, they probably didn't get discharged sooner because they had a doctor who remembered the, the sketchy micro video on, on strep pneumonia and figured out the appropriate antibiotic to prescribe but they might have gotten discharged sooner because they had a spouse or a caregiver who pushed their care a little harder or made it a little easier for them to be discharged sooner than someone else who got admitted in a medically similar circumstance. And all of you all probably recognize that a patient who didn't survive their CHS, CHF exacerbation, it's probably not because their doctor just didn't remember to diurese them because they somehow forgot about the Starling curve because their USMLE scores were that low. And it's more likely that patients who have an identical Charlson comorbidity index may nonetheless have very different social determinants of health that make them more likely to have a bad outcome, even if the primary diagnosis in an administrative data set is the same. Scoring highly on the USMLE is an important step in accumulating medical training and career capital. And doctors who score highly are somewhat more likely to provide care to patients in settings that are better resourced and to patient populations that are more likely to have a favorable outcome, even if those subtle differences are hard to account for in a multivariable regression model. And ultimately, if you look past any other flaw, I think that's the likeliest explanation for what the findings in this study represent. And folks, that's all I've got. Thanks for listening. Thank you.